Hi everyone, welcome back to the Earth on Survival Guide, the podcast for all disciplines, paths, players, and game masters. With your questers, Josh and Dan, I am Dan. I am Josh. And on today's podcast, we will be discussing all things celebrational, because we have hit 150 podcast episodes as of this recording. So if you have any questions for us about anything at all, how we got here, please contact us at edsgpodcast at gmail.com because we don't have any idea how we got here other than one day at a time. That's how it happens. Yeah. So we're taking a break from our sort of normal series that's going on. Usual content. Here's what is in store for you for today's episode. Do tell us, Josh. First off, we're going to start off by talking about numbers and metrics and whatnot, looking back at the past three years that we have been doing yeah. this. Yeah. Because we're coming up to the end of our third year. We started in 2019, but it was the very tail end. Yeah, it was October that. something. Yeah, October October 2019 was sort of when we launched. Yeah. But three years, 150 episodes uh, with more still to come. We do not have in this episode a special interview or guest or anything like that. Nope. After we talk about numbers and metrics and, and where things stand in that regard, we are going to sort of address a suggestion or question that we got at some point. And I don't know that we actually You found it on it. Discord, you said. Uh, yeah, I might have gotten it on Discord. Yeah. I don't remember who what, who it was, but this idea came in and I thought, oh, that would be a really cool thing for a special episode. Yes. We are going to go through a sample potential suggested campaign order mm -hmm. for pre-written slash published Earth Dawn adventures. Uh, this is going to include stuff from all the editions, which does mean that you would need to adapt it to whichever version of the rules yeah. you're using. It's going to include stuff from the Earth Dawn journal, the fanzine from the first yeah. edition days. It's going to have some of the, the adventures there. Dan is the one that kind of put this together. <laughs> so when we get to that point, blame me, I will let him address kind of how he put it together and, and what it was. And we'll kind of run through the list and maybe offer a little bit of non-spoilery, yeah. but insight into the various adventures and maybe what's going on in terms of greater arcs. Uh, not everything is included in no. this, but there no. is... There is a lot that is. It's a big plan. That's all I got. Yeah. <laughs> but before we get to that. Let's talk numbers. Let's talk some numbers. As of this recording, we are doing this on December 1st of 2022. Mm -hmm. Here are some numbers that our podcast host at Anchor.fm has provided for us. Anchor is affiliated with Spotify, and so all of you who are starting to see your, who are with Spotify or seeing your friends post their Spotify wrapped, which kind of summarizes the stuff that they listen to over the course of the year, there is something like that that is done for people who have podcasts on Spotify, and ours became available the other day, and I've already looked at it. We created in 2022, so just this past year, in 11 months, 1,849 minutes of new content, Whew, 1849, which is more than 91% of other creators in our category. Woo! And our category, I think, is like leisure slash games or something like that. Fair. I forget exactly. Yeah. But that's pretty impressive. I have a link to the full wrapped thing on the Twitter, uh, the EDSG podcast Twitter feed. You know, if you want to check that out, there are some really nice numbers there in terms of just like our growth and stuff like that. So that's all really cool. In terms of broader numbers, since our launch, we have a reading of a total of 68,104 plays. That is includes all downloads and any stream of 60 seconds or more across all the platforms that Anchor reads from. So that should include, if you listen on Google Podcasts or Apple Podcasts or Amazon Music, all of the ones that they pull numbers from, that includes all of those. So 68,104 times that an episode has been downloaded or streamed for more than a minute. Whoa. 
our average plays per episode at this point <laughs> is 180 plays per episode. This is the average number of plays that recent episodes receive in their first few weeks. I don't know what they mean by few weeks, but basically within its sort of new episode yeah, time launch. frame, it gets an, an average number of 180 plays using that same definition of play that yeah. we had in the total plays. Our audience size, as they measure it, is 298. That has gone up. That is the distinct, the number of distinct devices that downloaded or streamed an episode in the past seven days. So within the past week, there have been 298 unique devices that have accessed our podcast to some extent. We almost have 300 listeners. That's the audience size. That's actually pretty good. I'll take it. Hi, 300 of you. Yeah, yeah. I've got, I've got a graph here that shows our podcast performance. Obviously, you listening at home cannot see the graph, but this <laughs> is a graph that basically shows the breakdown of how many plays we have, and it'll give us the the total plays and, and stuff like that. I am curious. If I break it down daily, thus far, our single biggest download day was actually recently, uh, October 11th. A little over a month ago um, was the day that we epi- uh, launched the uh, second of our horror series episodes. So more horror spawn is the name of the episode 141. 272 total plays across all episodes that were played that day, uh, with 112 of them being that new episode. That means 26 of you slacked off and did not do it in the first day. <laughs> that <is> 298. <laughs> Prior to that, our next highest listen day was december 24th of 2020 which had 270 total plays and the reason that that had such a high spike particularly at that time where we had only been around a year was because that was the date that i launched that i uh uploaded the tales from the omniverse one shot series that i did with yeah. the show uh and so while there were fewer listeners at that time because there were multiple episodes those all added up to a pretty significant number makes sense but our numbers have been steadily slowly but fairly steadily increasing yeah over the course of the last couple of years and that is thanks to all of you at home within or on the road or wherever within the sound of my voice (laughs) that's going on there i am curious aside from our first episode because i think that's still our most downloaded episode what's our next highest it actually is not oh that was actually what i was moving on to next nice i'm curious about most popular least popular yeah yeah so See, you, well, you can't do it that way because obviously an episode that was released back at the beginning is going to get more listens simply by the fact that it's been around longer. That's how bad The long works. tail basically means that things are going to add up. Yes. Our first episode, episode one, Introductions, which was published October 9th, 2019, is currently sitting at 1,258 plays. Wow. But our most, our most listened to episode... Uh, is actually episode three, <laughs> which is uh, history, geography, and linguistics. That's the first episode where we started talking about the the timeline yep. of Earth Dawn. Talked to, I think, gave a broad overview of the different parts of Barsave, and then talked about like languages or or something. I think it was a pronunciation guide. Might have had the pronunciation guide that has one thousand two hundred and eighty four plays as of <laughs> right now. I think the pronunciation guide would be would have been one of the more popular ones. Yes. Yeah, and then basically. The, the number of plays goes down the further into our catalog that you go. Obviously. Most recent. Our most recent episode. Yeah. Uh, that had been published at the time that we're recording this, which was episode 148, yeah. has the smallest number of plays. Yeah. But like, it's not necessarily, oh, the, you know, the oldest episodes have the most and it just goes down from there. There is some juggling around, like the discipline episodes tend to have a little bit more, a few more plays than non-discipline episodes that were released that's around right. the same time. But yeah, generally speaking, that's all, that's all going real well. Our audience, about half of our audience listens, slightly more than half, 55%, 56% of our listeners listen or at least are identified from their device or whatever as being in the United States. Obviously, the other half are not. Uh, Germany is our (laughs) second most listened from country with 13%. United Kingdom and Canada each have 6%. And then we start kind of dropping down from there. Yeah. 
About a third of our listeners listen on Spotify. About a quarter, 24% listen on Apple Podcasts. Uh, Only 7% on Google Podcasts. 28% other, which basically means like all of the other pod device pod catchers various like services and and whatnot that are out there yeah so yeah that's all really cool really happy with that the other thing that i want to talk about here real briefly because i launched this a little bit earlier this year is the earth on survival guide youtube channel where i have been uploading three episodes a week two old ones Going basically starting back with episode one and doing two episodes a week, uh, releasing Monday and Wednesday, and then on the Friday, uploading the video version of the new episode that dropped that week. So as of right now, we've got 48 Mm -hmm. videos up online, you know, again, starting with episode one and and right now, well, our... Most recent old episode was episode 33. Obviously, the new episodes have been kind of going up as well. But our metrics from there, we have for a channel that has only been up for uh, a few months, um, we have a total of 575 views, total watch time, uh, 154.9 hours. We've got... 35 total subscribers, that is people who have uh, clicked subscribe on that. And yeah, and um, if you, even if you aren't necessarily going to like watch the videos, it's really, it would be really great if you've got YouTube um, to go and find the the Earth Dawn Survival Guide channel and uh, just click subscribe. Don't set with notifications or anything if you don't really care to see the videos when they come up. But if you want to watch them on there, then by all means, uh, do so, uh, click like, you know, do all the stuff to help drive the algorithm to maybe have it recommend to. Yeah. Cause there's not actually a video to watch. It's just, it's not Josh's, uh, pretty face or my pretty face up there. Yeah. <laughs> it's just the logo. <laughs> it's a static splash screen. That's got the logo, the episode number, the, the, the title, the release date, all of that is in there. You know, so it's something that you could at you like, you don't need to watch a screen. You can actually just listen to it the same way that you would the regular podcast. Yeah. You just get on YouTube instead. Episode one has the most views at 51. The second most popular, interestingly enough, is episode 23. That's the one, uh, par length weapons and armor, uh, has 31 views. Interesting. The older episodes have a lot more views than the, the newer one. As usual. And I think that there are people who are like maybe kind of going through the older episodes who might not have encountered the show before, um, rather than listening to the new ones are, are listening to the old yeah. ones, which is fine. Totally. But like for something that, that has been only up, it's what, uh, August, six weeks, uh, September, October, November, three, like yeah. three and a half months, four months mm-hmm. here in a couple of weeks. For something that I'm that we're not really pushing and only kind of just made available, I I'm yeah. happy with it. It's it's getting That's any response. Cool. I'm happy with it. <laughs> so yeah, it's it's going well. I, I I like the numbers. I like where we are. It's cool to continue to see it grow. I think is what uh, what I want to say there. So thank you everyone who listens to us. Uh, whether you listen when the new episode drops, because I know there are a bunch of people who eagerly await the new episode. And listen to it as soon as they can when it drops. But those of you who also uh, who have joined us more recently and have been working your way through the backlog, <laughs> we've gotten emails from folks who are like, I don't know whether you've answered my questions yet because I'm not listened. I'm not caught oh, up on the damn. episodes, but that's fine. Yeah, we'll take them. We appreciate each and every one of you, uh, whether you send in emails or not. It's nice to know that we're not just kind of talking into the void. Agreed. Nope. I love, I love the interaction with everybody's emails. I need to hear from Kagorsi again. Cause I haven't heard from K- Kagorsi in about what? A hundred episodes. Been a, while. been a while. Dude, come on. How you been with your ax? So that, that is that 150 episodes. What was the other thing that we, that we had been kind of looking at as, as a metric, uh, like a rating website. Oh, I used to have that. Do you remember? Oh, listen notes. Oh, was it Listen Notes? Was that what it is? The website is listennotes.com. And our global rank is in the top 5%. <laughs> yeah, one of the things about podcasting, about the podcast space, is that in some ways does not take 
a lot to end up in a yeah decent percentile if you are putting out content regularly it doesn't actually take a lot of listeners to get into those kind of numbers obviously yes and especially in terms of like gaming podcasts and whatnot I, I think we're in a reasonable space. I haven't done a lot of research on listen notes to see what, yeah. like how things compare. But those are numbers no, okay that, that, again, like kind of make me happy. What is a listen score? In that regard. On a scale from zero to 100, the higher, the more popular. Calculated from first and third party data, updated monthly. So at the beginning of the month. So basically, as of this is the first of December, uh, we we're solicited as uh, 30. I remember starting off at like 10. So I think we're doing pretty well. Wow, what is Global Rank? This podcast, EDSG Podcast, is one of the top 5% most yeah. popular shows out of 2.98 million podcasts globally. That Listen Notes ranks. That Listen Notes ranks. I can't imagine they're missing one with 2.98 million in there, but that's just me. So, yeah, that's how we're doing. I'll take that top 5%. So, fine. So, not bad. Josh came across this, and what you told me was you found this, this question on Discord. And it was an interesting proposition that interestingly enough, I already kind of had a pseudo answer for. And the question you posed was that somebody else already asked. Uh, the question you asked of me was, if you were going to tell the tale of Bar Save, how would you string together the adventures that are published to do so? Does that ring a bell? Yeah, that's yeah. the basic idea of of what it was. When this first came up, I was like, this would be a really interesting thought experiment topic yeah. to cover. And Dan was like, hey, fortunately, I don't need to do a lot of work on this because I already I'm that kind of geek. <laughs> yeah. Explain to me where this came from and how you kind of worked this up. And then we'll kind of run through Fair. the list here that yeah, you yeah, put yeah. together. I've, I've had this list for about, and I'm not kidding you, about 20 years. I was, me and uh, my group and I different game all together. And uh, as, if you listen to episode one, you can probably guess we were playing uh, The World of, of Cinnabar. And it's high tech and magic and all kinds of things. It's got it's, it's an everything a thon type game. One of my players said, "You know, I miss just good old fashioned low tech sword and sorcery." So, what do you guys think about playing? And I said, "Hang on, I have the game for you." To Earth Dawn, I've always wanted to play Earth Dawn, but since no one else had any of the books, it was up to me to introduce it to them. So I had to be game master. So I got everybody together. We made characters, and then. I started finding some smaller, smaller, smaller adventures to run. And then it turned out to be a huge hit. We've been playing it now for the last 20 years. So I won. I played, you know, I got everybody introduced to Earth Dawn and they all love it. But it took me about 10 years to hand over the reins to somebody else to go, can I play finally? If you guys like this game enough, you've bought all the books. Can someone else run this for a while? So what ended up happening is I created this list of all the adventures and I used a very rudimentary kind of stupid mathematical formula for my own edification, which was every adventure says it's recommended for this number of players to this number of players from this circle to this circle. So if it was like, it's four players mainly from first to third circle, then I did math of four players times one, four players times two, four players times three, averaged those numbers out and got a number, kind of like a challenge rating. As I said, Really stupid, but it worked for my purposes. I didn't necessarily ever expect to share this, so now you can all see my my process. Well, just as like a, a really rough idea to have a an idea in terms of a scale from quote unquote easiest to most difficult, or or at least recommended yeah. lowest circle to highest circle where things fell. It's not guaranteed that one no. that has a score of 15 is necessarily going to be yeah. more difficult than one that has a score of 12. It really depends on the specifics of what goes on in the adventure and like balancing any adventure. Oh, yeah. More art than science. But at least it gives you a rough idea of mm -hmm. these are low circle introductory adventures. These are ones that are, you know, are, are more higher novice. These are ones that are lower journeymen. Exactly. And that's, that's all I did. It, because if you take a look at Mists of Betrayal, which is one of the first published adventures ever, it says six to eight players of first through, th six to eight characters of first through third circle. Well, that's kind of a range. If you take the six times one, you get six. You take the eight times three, you get 24. So between six and 24 was the challenge rating. So I averaged all those numbers out and got a number. So that's, that was the method. You did a lot more math than was necessary. <laughs> oh, totally. 
if you have a range like that, you can actually mm-hmm. just take the average or the mean of each range and multiply them yeah. together. Mm-hmm. Because one to three averages out to two. Yeah. What you're doing is you are more fine tuning it, but ultimately two is the middle of one to three and seven is the middle of six to eight. And the number therefore is 14, which is what yeah. you come up with after you have done all of your, you used a spreadsheet, so it wasn't difficult, but I just like spreadsheets and it worked, it worked out quite well. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> Josh is schooling me on math, which is just fine. It's not my strong suit. I admit Look, that. I got, I got my start in this by brute forcing the statistics of the step table <laughs> to answer a question that was a huge debate back in the nineties. Yes. No, it's fine. My brother was the uh, mathematician and boy, could he math anyway. So all that being said, I started this with just simple little quick adventures, hoping to, to, to whet people's appetite to keep playing or to eventually take the reins off my hands. And so I grabbed everything I could that was small, short, or, um, I can't say one session, one or two sessions yeah. kind of thing. One nighters, things like that. One night stands. So I started off with three, I think all from the same author because they, I, they happened to strike at the right chord with me. I started with, in most cases, night of desire, the search for wisdom, which is now called the uh, rune tomb, tomb. And then the days of vengeance. I think all three of these were written by a guy named David Carolay, and they all came from the earth dawn journals because they were short yes. They were sweet and they were perfect. And I know I have listed, I've done an actual review on drive through RPG for Runevere's Tomb. Anyway, Night of Desire and Days of Vengeance have the same recurring character, recurring bad guy, Listener the Mighty. And I broke those up on purpose because there has to be a time frame in between for the bad guy to lick his wounds and come back for vengeance, which is why it's called Days of Vengeance. But it takes place just outside of Kratos. And then the search for wisdom starts just outside of Kratos as well. And you travel down to Ustrecht and come back. So I figured it's kind of a centrally located city, more or less, uh, where Kratos is and not a bad place to start. I didn't actually pay attention that Thrall was the capital. I didn't want to start people off in Thrall the capital. That's fine. That's just how that works. (laughs) Just how that worked. Yeah. Those are all good, short introductory adventures. Days of Vengeance really does need Night of Desire as the lead into it. And you do want to have kind of the space between them. So having the the travel from Kratos to Ustrecht and back, that's a journey that's actually going to take several days in in each direction, um, which will absolutely give time for, for things to pass. Those two are both in Earth on Journal number mm-hmm. five. All of these, incidentally, are available electronically, both, I'm pretty sure, on our on the FASA Games website, as well as at Drive yes. Through RPG. And then Search for Wisdom was in Earth on Journal 2. It is also available in a third uh, Red Brick did a yes. shard called Runevere's Tomb, which is a slightly modified mm-hmm. version of it, but has the same basic storyline. So you could kind of use either yeah. of them. But Runevere's Tomb is a is a really solid like introductory scenario, Agreed. playable in a in a session yeah, or that's... two. Um, so those are are really good, uh, really good kind of start off trilogy of things. Yeah, because there's there's you 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 fight against a illusionist in Night of Desire and Days of Vengeance. You have mobs. You have is for in search for wisdom is even a minor horror you go up against at the very end. So it literally is just those three together. I think a fantastic introduction to the world of Earth Dawn itself without getting too deep. Yeah, and that's one of the things that I think is valuable when it comes to introducing people to Earth Dawn. Yes, the lore and history and everything is rich and fascinating. But you don't need to throw new people into the deep end, especially if you've got people who are kind of familiar with generic fantasy yeah. role playing in general. You want to do things that kind of highlight where Earth Dawn is a little bit different from what they may have encountered before to really give them that taste without them feeling like they need to do a whole bunch of homework. These first three scenarios are all kind of stereotypical in one sense. Um, the first one is kind of a rescue mission in a way. Somebody gets abducted and, and you are off to rescue them. Uh, the second one is a kind of classic, like sort of dungeon crawl care delve sort of situation. Although it's not actually a care, it's a tomb, but that kind of idea. 
and uh, dealing with a, a minor horror, which is a big thing in Earth Dawn. And then the third one is the bad guy from the first adventure comes back to get his revenge. It's it's a nice little trilogy. I don't recall having any real objections or problems with any of the storylines of those adventures or, or how they generally worked. So yeah, it's a, it's a nice kind of like good introduction. So then I, I decided that uh, enough travel took place in between the adventures that I would just throw people into the actual adventures that they ran. And so I figured uh, Earth Dawn, again, I was trying to keep these brief, is an adventure called The Kiss. And I'm into props. I actually went out and found the earrings that you need to have for this game, for this adventure. And this was written by Greg Gordon, who actually, I think, wrote a lot of the magic system for Earth Dawn. Yeah, Greg was one of the core designers for Earth Dawn. He was like the primary yeah. like game system designer. So I figured the, th- the the original trilogy and then of of adventures, sorry, and then one written by the actual game design, one of the game designers would again be the nice introduction as this is how the world of Earth Dawn should be presented to everybody uh would be next. So that was fun. And then I just started grabbing what I could I then went to Into the Breach, which is a quick little one-nighter, just because... Yeah, this is the adventure that was included with yes. the second edition, mm-hmm. the Living Room Games second edition Game Master screen. I'm not crazy about that adventure. I will be completely <laughs> honest. If you go to my website at loremerchant.com under reviews, I wrote a review for it back before yeah. I was actually working on Earth Dawn in any kind of official capacity back in the the early 2000s after this had come out. And there are some, uh, on one level, the, it's kind of like a basic adventure because it's the one that's included with the screen. But storyline-wise, there are some things that just don't really make a whole lot of sense plot-wise to me in it. It's fine, but I think to make it actually make sense, you kind of need to do a little bit more work with it. Which is fine. I used it as a one-nighter and I took out what I wanted to use and used what I... Yeah. So, it was okay. Then I seriously got in... uh, uh, Ran, I believe, six people through Mist of Betrayal. Yes. As written, because we were still playing first or... Yeah, I think that that time we were still playing first edition rules because we hadn't done it. Uh, any conversion over to second or because third wasn't even out yet. So that's where we went from there. Then back to Earth on Journal number nine went for inheritance, which I don't remember anything about. I don't recall anything about that either. I was hoping you would. Yeah. Remember. Oh, this is written by uh, Kathleen Zachowski. Oh, Kathy. Yeah. yeah, I know Kathy. And this this actually is designed as a bridge between Mr. Betrayal and Terror in the Skies. OK, which is why I ran this one, because I came back to Terror in the Skies two adventures later, not one. So this is, yeah, it takes place at the Gilded Griffin, and right, this is a circular care that they have to go explore in Care Pioralon. So I am vaguely now, yeah, I am vaguely starting to remember this one. Yeah, this one's vague to me. Yeah, I <laughs> knew Kathy from back in the days of the Earth Dawn mailing list and, and the early 2000s. I met her at... um origins in 2005 i think it was this was when red brick was like getting ready to release the original players game masters compendia and james flew in from new zealand and Dami Mm -hmm. flew in from germany we went down and and visited with lou one day and then went to origins and had a a panel like we did a panel where we were kind of showing things but yeah i met i met kathy in person there and i've known kathy uh, for a number of years, haven't like spoken with her a lot, but uh, she's done a couple of things for for FASA games when she's had time and whatnot. But she's kind of busy with other things, and it's, I mean she's still yeah, around. Fair enough. But no, so uh, uh, Heritance is a nice little adventure. Uh, des- like I said, designed to go between Mr. Betrayal and ter- Terror in the Skies. What I did for a one shot is I finally had had my characters were in a great place. They knew their characters. My players knew their characters really, really well. And so I did a one night stand from the Earth Dawn Publishing Trust, a little tiny adventure called Turnabout is Fair Play. And it was completely non-combat. And they were at this lavish party. And it was basically the all social interactions that were set up. And so if you need to have your 
your players figure out who their characters are. I recommend Turnabout is Fair Play because it is a interesting social experiment where they actually have to roll R-O-L-E play more of their character than dice rolling, you know, talents and things. So the publishing trust was something that I was actually involved with. This was a fan project that was started after the original FASA shut things down and before I think Living Room Games announced that they were picking things up and doing a second edition. The publishing trust was a bunch of us from the mailing list looking to continue to support the game with our own stuff. Um, I didn't end up like writing or doing a whole lot with them when all was said and done. Um, Not a lot ended up really getting done long term with them that I'm aware of. But some material was put out. Some of the stuff that was on there was yeah. was written by people who would go on to work with Red Brick in the future and stuff like that. So Agreed. It was good stuff. Group of folks. Uh, then I actually ran Terror in the Skies. Much that when somebody finally did take the reins from me and be the game master, that was the first one that they ran. So I get to play in that adventure as one of my first uh, outings as well. So that was very, very nice to go through. Yeah. I mean... I have mentioned in the past that I have some issues with the game balance in those adventures in terms of like the difficulty that they actually present versus the recommended circles and stuff like that. And I think part of that is just it was a new game at the time and they were still kind of maybe getting a handle on how things actually worked to a certain extent. But storyline wise, both Miss of Betrayal and Terror in the Skies are a lot of fun and have really interesting environments and memorable encounters and characters and all sorts of stuff that goes on with both of them. So yeah, big, big fan of both of those. And really, either one serves really well to give a broad multi-session overview of the high points and interesting things uh, that make Erston a little bit different. Agreed. And especially back in the nineties when they were initially released, no argument. And uh, my friend ran tear in the skies in a manner where he rearranged the order of events. And so it came to me as a surprise since I'd run it before I got to play with the expectation of, I didn't know what was going to happen next because it was all out of order. And that was a great thing to do. I have no problem with that at all. Rescue from Earth on Journal number two, the other one from Earth on Journal number two, I think finally introduced the Chinta people. That rings a bell. Yeah. They only showed up in that adventure, yeah. as far as I so, know. It's an encounter that kind of takes place on the shores of Death Sea and a problem that you have to kind of deal with there. Yeah. So they basically have been from Kratos to Ustrecht, Mist of Betrayal from Parlanth to the Bloodwood. Trevada's Fair Play takes place pretty much anywhere. Terror in the Skies is down near Trevar. Trevar. And now this is near Death Sea. So they've gone a whole lot. They've they've covered quite a bit of the map. And then uh, the Earth Time Publishing Trust are in Gypsies in the Palace, which I do not recall at all. Oh, another one by Kathleen uh, Zachowski. So, by Kathy? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, doesn't surprise me. It's a, it's a quester of Theranius and a tidy sum of silver borrowed, uh, in a borrowed mansion. So, you know, also fun to do. Maybe that was the one I was thinking of. No, it's about for play. Anyway, also fun. Little, you know, a little one-nighter just to kill some time. Uh, then I ran Arcane Mutterings, which is also Earth on Publishing Trust number three. Again, Kathy Zachowski. I ran a bunch of hers, so. <laughs> she was one of the primary folks that actually produced material yeah. for the Publishing Trust. And did a good job. So I had no problem with that. And then I actually had the chance to run Ardanian's Revenge, which takes place right just south of the um, Thrall capital. So that was fun. Yep. And I had it where my group was running from the outside trying to get in instead of a new group on the inside trying to get out. So, because that one can be run both ways. That's, a, that's yes. an interesting adventure. I liked it. Uh, especially the, the magic items were cool. The art was good. And the layout of the care I thought was fantastic. So those, those are my favorite parts of it. And I'm just a nuts and bolts type of person. Uh, then I ran infected where we get to meet classic Ardelia classic adventure great adventure I think out of the official FASA adventures Fair. probably my second favorite just because it is intentionally designed as an adventure where the group yep. can't just walk in and punch their way out of the problem I really like that. Yeah. Written by Robin Laws, who is phenomenal (laughs) as a list of credits longer than my arm 
wrote a bunch of stuff for for Earth Dawn. He wrote the Thrall Source book. He wrote the the Theron Empire book. He wrote he wrote so much yeah. stuff for Earth Dawn. He was like one of the primary yeah Earth Dawn writers for you know he wrote he wrote I a just... bunch of stuff for Earth Dawn, and it's almost all phenomenal. Um, he has gone on to write even more phenomenal stuff. Robin is fantastic, uh, and I'm a huge fan of his. I was going to say, I just came across uh, Robin Laws' name on a Firefly role-playing game supplement from just a few years ago. So Yeah, yeah. Robin Robin yeah, has been in hang. the industry at, like forever <laughs> at this point and yes. is, you know, one of those legendary names for people who kind of keep track of those things, like up there with, you know, Monty Cook or or folks like that who have actual like name recognition yeah. uh, in terms of, of their totally. stuff. He's fantastic and a, and a wonderful guy. I've met yeah. him a couple of times. So the, the next one I, I ran was f- you actually had to visit the Library of Thrall, the Great Library of Thrall, because they'd heard about it, but they'd never actually come across it. They never actually get to submit their journals to it. So this is from Shadi Magazine, number 40. I always called it Shadis. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, pff, I've made it sound fancy. S-H-A-D-I-S. This was back in the 90s when like print gaming magazines were a thing. Oh, yeah. I actually have somewhere in my storage a pretty significant run of this uh, i was shadis and um inquest was another magazine yeah that was more geared towards like magic and collectible card games mm-hmm. well dragon magazine obviously that was you know uh tsr's house yeah. organ and and i've got a whole bunch of of those you know in print but yeah uh, shadis was really cool because they covered other mm-hmm. games dragon was D D. Yeah. shadis was other games like they had earth on appear in their pages multiple Agreed. times only one adventure mm-hmm. but they had earth on show up a, a number of times they did some stuff for like uh, white wolf world the original world of darkness stuff uh, a whole bunch of like the the cool like 90s oh, semi indie yeah. games like a lot of really cool stuff uh, in those yeah, w- whatever was hot at the time and not D and D, so I appreciated them. No, it was, it was it was really cool, and I don't know where my I think they're up in a storage tote up in up in my attic. I don't think I have the whole run, but I've got a pretty significant yeah. number of those. So I'll explain why I ran this one next. What we had done is. According to the rules in the first edition, Earth Dawn Companion, you could make your own discipline. And so my friend and I had done that. We made the Mystic, we, we made the Mystic Warrior, because it was uh, unofficial, but it was published in, in Earth Dawn Journal number two. And then we made a combat mage, because it's mentioned in the book when you're making a, your character in that little section, but there's no actual combat mage. So we, we made rules around this, just to see if a homebrewed discipline could go toe-to-toe with the official game disciplines. And then we realized how broken they were. <laughs> and so by the book is the adventure in Sh- uh, Shadis Magazine, where you come across the horror called the Unnamer. And one of its powers is it gets to take your talent away. So after you defeat the Unnamer, you, you get to basically spend all your legend points that you got defeating him and putting your talents back. So that was how I was able to, re- un- to unbreak the making of those disciplines, those homebrew disciplines, and put the talents for order where they should have been. But we used the rules the first time. We just didn't balance it well. Anyway, they're more balanced now, but then we went on from there. So I recommend buy the book if you want to use the unnamer to... If you can find if it. If you can find it. It's fan- Every once in a while, it pops up on, on eBay, but you have to go for uh, episode, uh, issue number 48 for this adventure. Every once in a while, it's there. Then I went on to actually crack open the, the par length box set. I figured my entire group had done enough wandering around and they needed to call someplace home for uh, a little bit. And so I figured I would introduce them to par length and bring this all kind of full circle since they did Mist of Betrayal, where they kind of start off in Haven and go to the Bloodwood and back. Par length adventures was next. I ran all four of those adventures in the order that I chose to do them in. And that was kind of fun as well. They got to stay there a long time. Uh, that was the last one my brother played in. And then I ran from the Earthbound Publishing Trust number two, Woodland Whispers. And I think this was actually written, I want to, I th- yeah, I thought it was written by, by I'm pretty sure that, Karsten. Was, that was done. Yeah. So that was also a very uh, interesting, fun play to do. I skipped over, I was going to do Path of Deception and I realized I didn't quite want to get that deep into the weeds, but then I ran out of the Earthbound Journal number three, 
to Scrang Trouble and out of the Earth Dungeon number seven. And the path shall be perilous. And then I just ran the shard Blackout, which takes place underneath the Kingdom of Thrall. So I kind of put my folk, my group kind of all over the map. I left Iopos and Jerus uh, kind of out of things. They were unexplored. I haven't gotten back into game mastering because I've been playing for the last three years, but I have to enjoy that. But the rest of my list kind of goes like this. Pale River, still underneath Thrall. Burning Desires from Red Brick as well, kind of in there. Betrayal Sting, kind of around the Kingdom of Thrall as well. So I kind of keeping him right in there, just, just north of the Thunder Mountains. Then they have to go back to Revar for tournament troubles. And then I finally would update the timeline to get them into Prelude to War and Bar Save at War. Yeah. If you are looking to do, okay, I want to run a campaign that is going to be kind of growing along and becoming involved with the notable events, Prelude to War and, uh, and Bar Save at War are the key ones. We were talking offline before we yeah. started recording about this, and I did note that there are several adventure frameworks or suggested adventures that are in some of the original yeah. published books that kind of tie into things. Like there's one that's kind of a follow-up to Infected. There are some others in there. And in Prelude to War... There is actually a list included in that in terms of the recommended adventure frameworks in various books that tie into the greater events of what's going on there. And that's something that you could look at uh, to get even more stuff to perhaps fill in or replace some of these things that you might not be able to find in in Dan's list. I happened to be uh, on the ground floor when Earthon came out. So as things were published, I snagged what I could. (laughs) So... Happened to be there at the right places at the right time. After that, my list kind of concludes with Shattered Pattern and then Bar Save and Chaos, because you have the Prelude, Bar Save at War, and then Bar Save and Chaos. Those three kind of tie together, but I figured a little dust settling for Shattered Pattern would be a nice little interlude. Come back for Blades, and then the Orc Nation of Carafad has adventures, and then finally round up everything and go back to Kratos for the right. Thievery Competition, Dead Man's Contract, and Hunting the Imposter. Which are all included in Kratos Adventures, yep. which was a Red Brick uh, third edition product. Oh, yeah. has a kind of nice uh, situation that's going on there. It is the adventure in which uh, the characters can recover the Blades of Carafad, uh, which are the key mm-hmm. bit of the Blades Adventures series, which is my favorite of the original published series, because it is a great example of how you can use magic items to drive a story and how and like examples of how you can learn the important or, or like how you can tie learning advent the key knowledges of an item into adventures that might happen um, and it all connects into well in blades i don't think has the problem with it i was just thinking that blades does not have to happen before prelude to war but whether it happens before or after it will kind of affect a little bit the Mm -hmm. way that things might play out overall. If I were doing this today. Fair. Because I understand this is, this is old. This is something you had set up a while ago. Oh, this is 20 years ago. There are a couple of things that, that I would update briefly. I would probably skip into the breach. Please, by all means. There are enough problems with that adventure (laughs) and it's short enough that I don't feel like you are missing anything by skipping it. Mm Mm-hmm. The other thing that no, no. I would do would be to, again, especially if you're trying to get it today, many of these, the Earthstone Journal ones you can get in PDF. So those like you could find. Mm-hmm. I was just doing, while you were talking, I was doing a Google search. It's possible that the full issue of uh, Shadis number 48 that by the book is in is available on Scribd which is like a, an online repository for like PDFs oh, and nice. stuff. But it looks like in order to get access to it, you need to like a subscription member or paying it or whatever. It looks like uh, Kenzer Co., the people that do Knights of the Dinner Table, have like the first eight, the original eight issues of Shadis mm-hmm. up on their site available in PDF, but nothing <laughs> like beyond that. Wow. So, I, I mean, it's possible you might be able to find if you do no. a little bit more digging. I, this was just like a quick, like couple of minute search. I would also, because of the divergence in timelines from 2nd edition and 4th edition, which we talked about way, way back in the beginning of this show, 
I, w- I will not belabor that point here now. Oh, you're yeah, totally. You could use Living Room Games Bar Save at War as a general template, but kind of alter things to fit the the event descriptions as they are given in the Game Master's Guide. The inciting incident for the war is notably different. There's also yes. a bunch of adventure frameworks and hooks in Orc Nation of Carafod and Crystal Raiders of Bar Save that kind of tie into things leading up to the war. So that's a place you could look to get more ideas. Um, but I would try to run the war to try and, and at least in terms of the, the grand scale of things, have them be a little bit more in line with what this gets described in fourth edition, which uh, if you go and look at the last of the history timeline that we talked about where we address, where I, you know, talk about those issues. Yeah. And I would completely skip bar save and chaos. Fair. I'm not crazy about it for a few reasons. One of which is because of how it kind of diverges from the timeline as, as we've kind of been growing it. What you would want to do at that point is look mm-hmm. towards empty thrones as kind of the, the replacement yeah, in a, in a sense for that. Yeah, because this because my list is old enough. I haven't actually yeah. covered anything from fourth edition yet. As far as there is perfect, nothing in this it. series from uh, the Skypoint Adventures collection. You know that's a little bit out of nope. the way in terms of the the travel area, but there are some a couple of good adventures in there. Because my my main thing was if somebody actually wanted to run Earth on and take it off my hands, I was going to give them the Skypoint Vivain boxed set and say, "Here's your playground." Here's your sandbox. I intentionally left it alone, didn't peek at it, didn't look at it, didn't know about it, so I could hand it off to somebody and say, here's your, here's the corner of bar save to start with. You start here, because I've not interfered with anything you want to do. And, you know, and, and of course, you could always <laughs> look at adapting the Legends of Bar Save Haven stuff while they're in par length to kind of use that. Yep. But yeah, this is pretty good. For not knowing what I was doing, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's basically, okay, let me take all of the, the published stuff that I can find as it kind of came out over the course of time and get a sense yes. of roughly where it falls in terms of power level and kind of move on from there. I mean, based on the way that how quickly advancement works, a lot of those early adventures, I mean, you don't get to infect it until, what is that, like number 12 or 13 on your list here? Something like that. And infected is is only like rated as a, like a second to fourth circle adventure. Like it's still a novice tier. A lot of these, uh, um, especially where it's after Mist of Betrayal and Terror in the Skies. Yeah, your characters are going to be well, notably more. What happened was for the about the first, and I'm not going to lie, about the first six, you know, all the way down through Mist of Betrayal. So for seven, uh, everybody was remaking characters. Not that they died. They're just kind of like, okay, this character was cool for this one. I want to make this. And so they would literally, I have a, I have one of my players has eight, <laughs> has eight earth on characters. I have another player who has seven earth on characters. My brother had seven earth on characters because they wanted to figure out exactly what they wanted to play. And so by the time we got done with Mr. Betrayal, I said, okay, now is the time. You guys need to settle on something. Settle a character that you want to. And as, as I've said, write a novel about because the next few adventures from here on are going to be what you're going to write a novel about in your mind. uh, You know, if you go home and take notes and so forth and so on. So yeah, the first six or seven are here's the world, go play, make a character. If you like it, you know, great. Keep it. If not, you know, move on to the next. And so it was a rotating cast of characters for the first six or seven adventures. I'm not kidding you. I actually have my, my game master journals on those. And so I actually have written down who played what character, what circle they were and who got what, loot and treasure and so forth and so on and what happened to everybody. So I have all that and I need to read those notes one of these days. But yeah, by, by Mr. Betrayal, I think is where everything kind of solidified, if not by heritance. So somewhere in there, the the group finally solidified, ah, that's the character I'm going to play on a long-term basis. So yes, you are not wrong. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a good (laughs) retrospective of the various adventures and whatnot that have been released yeah. officially and semi-officially mm-hmm. over a, a good chunk of like the first half of Earth Dawn's history. Cause you know, what you've got in here takes you up through the Kratos source book yeah. and then the Kratos adventures for, for Red Brick 
um, which was one of the few sort of fully original things that was done. Yep. Rather than it being sort of reprints of other stuff. Yeah, those actually, the adventures in those are a little bit higher circle. Oh, incredibly so. <laughs> I was like, ah, and this will wrap things up because that's going to be a, that's going to be a big, big yeah. thing. Their circles nine to 12. Yeah. So I figured by the time they got there, I could, I could handle ninth circle or whatnot. But most of my characters, the, the characters I'm running when I run are fifth and full now. So that's when they hit, you know, Pale River, Burning Desires, Betrayal Sting. So they're all right in line with where they sh- for those adventures. So, yep. A whole yeah. bunch of stuff that kind of takes place in and around Thrall. A couple of those shards yep. were in the original Thrall Adventures book from first edition. Burning Desires was a, an original yes. adventure uh, made for Red Brick by Andrew Ragland, um, who went on to become the yep. primary mind behind 1879, the RPG, and did a lot of the, the setting work and, and whatnot for that game. Yeah, because I, I remember Andrew's stuff from the Earth on Journal that I came yeah. across. Andrew was the editor of the of the Earth on Journal. Yeah. I think, uh, at least for part of the time. Part of it, yeah. But yeah, yeah, like he's he's another of those has been involved with Earth Dawn since the earliest days. Yes, always appreciated everything he wrote for it. It was it was good. It was the best of the best stuff that was in there. So that's pretty much my solution to how would you tell the tale of Bar Save by stringing all these adventures together. I had him pretty much go almost all over the map. I left the very western portion alone. Yep, the weakest. <laughs> Part of your whole series there is that because a lot of these are one shots and so forth, there is not a huge amount of game master character continuity. There's not necessarily a lot of connection between the various events until you get kind of into the into the later stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that's fine. Like there's nothing wrong with that necessarily. But that's where, like, looking at the list of related frameworks and whatnot in other source books that you have at the beginning of the Prelude to War book as something that you can look at, you know, maybe sow some seeds earlier in terms of having characters. With so much stuff that you have going on in Thrall in that stretch, Mm -hmm. there is a lot of opportunity there to maybe have your characters get known or recognized by characters or personalities that are going to be more significant in prelude to war, you know, especially when it comes to yeah. Varulus's assassination and stuff like that. It's really cool. And I appreciate you having this handy so that we could talk <laughs> about this and reminisce about some things. I appreciate you being kind about my, my lack of organization on where all those things fit, which is again, it's absolutely fine. I had no idea what I was doing. And yes, it felt like, an, you know, a, a, the series of Kung Fu, which is, you know, all the other things yeah. change week to week, but the main character is the same. Yeah, Goes to a, a different town. That's all it was. Rather than a overarching, like a necessarily like kind of major overarching whatever, it is a little bit more perhaps yeah. episodic in nature. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you kind of know in advance that you're going to be dealing with this sort of thing then you could perhaps make some changes to these to have recurring characters show up and to have those kind of threads go from from adventure to venture and and place to place to kind of weave that together into something that people these days would be more inclined to recognize. Yeah, because I didn't I didn't do a whole lot of in between, you know, getting them from one place to the other and making that another mini adventure on its own as well. So I didn't have an overarching theme. I was just Hopefully someone who's going to take this off my hands to do their overarching thing so that I could play. And that has actually worked out. I had three of my players became game masters in their own right. One took us completely off the map, did his own thing. The other one, uh, literally, since I did not touch the Western part of the map, has us running through Jerus and Iopos and all that out there. And then my other game master, sorry, player that turned into a game master, took us all over the place as well. He did the whole Indiana Jones overlay your map with the the travel route from the red line of the plane. Yeah. So that's all, all. right. It's been fun. It's been a great 25 years uh, playing this game. 30th anniversary yeah. well, next year, folks. <laughs> 2023. <laughs> summer of 2023 will mark the 30th anniversary of the re- initial release of Earth Dawn. Yeah. Facet Games, we've got a couple of things planned for that, which we will announce 
Mm -hmm. as time moves on. And uh, we will continue here on the survival guide to bring you... (laughs) As much as we can. As much as we can. Lore discussion, rules discussion. We've got a bunch more stuff kind of planned in terms of of what's moving forward. Um, We may even go back and and possibly revisit older topics. If there's anything that you would like us to discuss, even if it's something that we might have potentially covered in an earlier episode, you've got questions or suggestions or anything like that, please feel free to contact us. What is that email, Dan? edsgpodcast at gmail.com. While it is still around, we still have the Twitter going. Mm -hmm. Who knows what (laughs) might end up with that over the next few weeks. I don't really post there much, but I do still kind of keep an eye on the um, if anything trends on Earth on Guild yeah. on Facebook. Mm-hmm. Of course, I am on the FASA Games Discord. Yep. So you can reach me there. I actually recently set up uh, not for the show, but for myself, a um, a Mastodon uh, account. There you go. Because um, that's where a lot of RPG folks who have been kind of fleeing Twitter <laughs> um, or setting up alternates to Twitter have moved to. Uh, I am on the dice.camp server. I'm lore merchant at dice.camp. If you are on Mastodon or use Mastodon, then you know kind of what that means and, and how you could find me. I am not posting much there yet, but I've got that ID kind of locked down. Fair enough. 150 episodes, Dan. Hard to believe. Yeah, this is fun. It's nice. It, it It's a lot of fun. And we appreciate the listeners, uh, those who send us emails and those who don't. And we need two more. So tell your friends because we have 298 as, a, as our audience, we think. So go tell at least two more people, one person each. <laughs> It'll get there. It'll get there. I just That's want 300 fine. by the time the, the year runs out. That's all. Uh, so... Until next time. Until next time. How about you all string together little stories of your life for your legend? Good night, everybody. <laughs>